Well, welcome then to the afternoon session of our conference and a very warm welcome to Pierre Cassou Nogues, who came here from Saint Denis. Um, Pierre Cassou Nogues is a author, um, a philosopher, a mathematician with a wide range of skills and knowledge. Um, he was born in Tunis and uh, he has been active uh, after having done uh, studies in mathematics and in philosophy as a uh, um, uh, research uh, director of the CNRS in Lille. And the CNRS, for those who don't know, uh, is a group of uh, highest level profiled research institutes in France in different cities, maybe a little bit like the Fraunhofer Institute or something. It's hard to compare between countries, but uh, he has been there for 10 years from 2001 to 2011, I think, when he then finally um, moved to the University of Paris 8, uh, Paris uh, Saint-Denis. And he has written a lot of interesting um, books, which sometimes are at the border of literature and fiction, sometimes at the border of history of mathematics and the hard sciences, and sometimes about speculations about new media and also about the problems that we are talking about in this uh, research group, neuroscience uh, problems and, and uh, phantasms and things that are uh, related to that. Just to mention a few of his publications, um, uh, there was um, a series of publications on Gödel, Gödel's introduction to logic in 1939. There uh, is a book uh, after Gödel. There is a book on Hilbert uh, uh, that was um, published with Edition Le Belle Lettre in 2001, Les Démons de Gödel, Logique et Folie. This is the logic and the insanity or <laughs> Wahnsinn und Logik uh, von Gödel. Uh, uh, published with uh, Edition Seuil in 2007. And one of my favorite books of Pierre Cassou Nogues is Mon Zombie et Moi, which is really a, a astonishing um, bath of different temperatures in between um, philosophical discourse and fiction. It's a fantastic book. <laughs> I can recommend it. So we are all looking forward towards your lecture about the synaptic uh, monster. Um, thank you very much for being here. So thank you for your invitation and, and your very nice uh, presentation, a bit too nice, and you're now bound to be disappointed after uh, what Matthias said. Um, uh, and I'm also very uh, pleased to take part in this workshop, and I've learned uh, many things. And, okay. Uh, so what I will what I will be speaking about is uh, various technological devices that are uh, that attach themselves to the human beings through emotions, and that are related to touch. So I must say from the beginning that I will have a very loose use of the words affects emotions, feelings, and I know your group has been working on that uh, for the last two years, and I have not, and so I'll have a very you know, uh, uh, loose uh, vocabulary, and maybe we can come back to this distinction in the, in the discussion and whether these machines are related to emotions or affects, really. So various techno technological devices uh, related to touch and emotions. And basically, I want to argue that they transform uh, touch and that they transform our relationships, our relationship to our emotion. Uh, so basically, the first part will be about touch. The second part, which will be a lot shorter, would be about, about our relationship to uh, our uh, emotions. But first, I want to say, don't mind the, the subtitle, I'll speak about them later on there for another project, but I didn't have the right file in order to uh, erase the, the subtitles. Um, uh, so before I get on with uh, this device and speak about uh, Pyro, which you see 
on the screen, I want to make a few method methodological remarks. So the methodological postulate that I adopt in, that I uh, take in um, the book that Matthias has spoken of, uh, My Zombie and I, is that metaphysics is not just telling story, but it is based on telling story. And the methodological postulate is, is that story that works opens up the possible that makes the domain of philosophy, okay, of metaphysics. So then the task of the metaphysician is to explore the possible that is, or the possibles that are opened up in story that works. So storytelling has a crucial uh, role, and in this perspective, the metaphysician has nothing to say about the real future. He can only discuss possible futures, things that may happen. So I precisely don't want to speak about you know, my, the stories I'll tell uh, are not related to, uh, that's the plug to recharge the thing. Uh, uh, the stories I'll tell are, are not related, I mean, they don't concern the real future, but a possible, uh, a possible future. And through this story, I want to, uh, uh, precise, I want to uh, explore our concept and the structures of our experience. Okay, so in order to tell a story that works, the... Uh, okay, uh, in order to tell a story that works, it is of course easier to take our terms from existing story and from science fiction. Uh, so what I'll attempt is part of an imaginary or metaphysical uh, critique of contemporary technology. So a critique of technology that takes its terms in science fiction and then that takes the form of a science fiction story. So to uh, wrap up the different uh, device, the different uh, analysis of device that I will try. Uh, to, wrap the, to wrap up them in a single story, I would like to describe the birth of a synaptic monster that turns humans into zombies. And there should be three parts to my story. I should discuss contemporary technology as nursing a monster and using uh, especially the novel of uh, Samuel Butler, Erwan, but uh, that should be the third part, but in fact that's the uh, third part uh, if I have done my two parts in 25 minutes, but it's very unlikely, so you won't have that part. But the two stories are, the two, story, the two points I want to stress in that story is the emergence of a new sense, which, or new sensibility, which I'll call synaptic, and but uh, more quickly, this idea of a transformation of humans into zombies, or what I'll call the syndrome of the thermometer. And that's the idea that contemporary technology transform our relationship to our own emotions. Okay, so what you saw was uh, footage from uh, footage featuring Paro, the therapeutic robot. So it's a project that uh, I do with two of my colleagues uh, Stéphane Desgoutins and uh, Gwenola Wagon. It's a film uh, we call, for the moment, it's called Welcome to Erron, uh, in, in reference to Samuel Butler's uh, novel, Erron. And it's a film made of uh, found footage and uh, presenting this imaginary city, uh, Erron, which would be uh, uh, the city of Samuel Butler, but before they have destroyed uh, the machines as uh, happens eventually in the city that uh, Samuel Butler's uh, character uh, visited. So it's a, it's, the film is only made of found footage, found on the uh, internet, and the, the model, you know, you have to aim high, so the model for this, the film would be Alphaville, the film by Godard, and in Alphaville, Godard uh, tells a science, a science fiction story, but using only Paris as a decor, contemporary Paris, the Paris from the 70s. And he films 
the city as if it was like a dark future. And the, the idea is to, to take uh, footage of things that exist and to you know, uh, tell the science fiction story and the moral of the story would be that this future is already there be, uh, beside our screen. And of course, what I'm interest, what we are interested in, uh, in in this device is the point where there is uh, something wrong, when there is an aberration. And in the uh, image that you saw, there is obviously a tension between the sweetness of the robot and something which is scary. And I think when we see this old, uh, this old persons. Uh, that are supposed to be made immediately happy by cuddling the robot, there's something scary. Uh, uh, there's something scary about it. And of course, as you could see, uh, power, has, power has to do with emotion and touch. So in fact, where's the aberration? When, what's, when, you see, when we see this footage, and I must stress that this footage is in fact comes from advertisement by the company that produced Paro. And so uh, it is something that the company thinks is good to show. It's an advertisement for Paro. I mean, different kind of adv advertisement that we have edited together. So what, where is the aberration? So there are several layers. One of them, of course, is the economical question, and that Paro uh, is in fact used to replace a nurse, and that instead of make a, having you know human contacts these old person have contacts with paro so that's uh, something that is uh, bothering also i think we feel that obviously this kind of touch is not really what matters in contemporary technology that it's something that is kind of anecdotal also a third point is uh, the fact that uh, Paro may be connected. So in fact, this version of Paro may not, but there's a new version which could be connected. And so there's a, a paradox that we take Paro or generally robots for individual beings, but in fact, their brain is somewhere else. And we'll discuss that much longer with when, we take a, when we speak about now, uh, another robot, and now it's like the iPhone. Uh, you know, the iPhone, when like, you use the speech recognition uh, app, uh, in fact, it's not the, the iPhone that translates speech into written language. The, the iPhone sends the speech to a server, and the server sends back the written words. So we take, say, the robot for an individual being, but in fact, its brain it's, is elsewhere. And it's not an, individ an individual being, it is more like part of a tentacular being or, or say, a monster. Uh, another aspect is that if we, in the new version of Paro, which is, which is connected, and uh, the idea is that it, it would be able to see through the touch of the patient when the patient has uh, some kind of um, uh, some kind of faint so when to discriminate between the patient going to sleep, which is fine, and the patient having some kind of attack. Okay, um, and so paro is also paro is also the mean of a surveillance and a surveillance that goes through touch, that is haptic, and I'll discuss that uh, quite at length. And that's something quite new, I think. And then there's the question, could the robot make us automatically, uh, automatically happy? And, and that, would, that will be related to, to my third part. And then a question which I won't uh, raise, which I'll then raise, but I won't try to answer, is the gender question. And it's remarkable that in all the footage we found, uh, Paro is in the hands of women, old women. And why, why not man? I mean, man die earlier than women, statistically, but there are still, you know, I mean, I have all hopes, there are still men who live up to 100 years. So why do we only show uh, Paro in the hands of women? And that's, when I'll speak about those various technology that are related to touch, that's something that will always come back. The question, and I, and I won't try to discuss that, to really tackle this question, but the question of gender. 
you know, when it is a man, when it is a, a woman. Okay, so uh, the first part about touch will be called synaptic versus uh, teleaptics. And the first, um, okay, uh, the first uh, device I want to uh, show is uh, the hug shirt. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you'll understand what it's about. Uh, I haven't found it, so you won't understand if you. And basically, the hug shirt is a t shirt that lets you send hugs over distance. So you put on the shirt, you give yourself a squeeze, and sensors in these areas on the fabric capture where you're touching, how strong you're touching, and for how long time. All this data goes Bluetooth into your mobile phone, and there is an app that is the hug shirt app that transforms all this data into a hug message. And when your friend receives the hug message, just push a button and all this data goes into their shirt and their shirt starts to get warm and vibrate in the same areas that you touched on your shirt. Do you have what you need? You know, she feels the hug has been sent to her. People have been waiting for the hug shirts for a long time. So we are premiering the new design for the hug shirts. So imagine you're in New York and your best friend is in Tokyo. You give yourself a hug and their shirt is going to get warm and vibrate in the same area that you touched on your shirt. All this data goes Bluetooth in your cell phone and it's transformed into the hug message. So it's a touch telecommunication over distance. And so okay, so you have the hug shirt that, uh, you know, you hug yourself and it goes into your phone and it's sent to your friend's phone and your friend feels the hug. Uh, in, in his or her shirt. But can you, you know, is the hug enough? Of course, there are other devices that can do uh, the same thing. Centuries, lovers have used many devices to keep the flames of passion going while they were apart. From letters to telegraphs and even smoke signals. As technology progressed, so did the devices. But there was never a product that provided actual sensation from one partner to the other until today. Introducing Lovenz, the world's first love toy that senses and reacts to your lover's movements. Lovenz is a new line of lovemaking toys that have a unique ability. They can be controlled via your smartphone from across the street, across town, or even across the country. Not only can you remotely control your lover's toy, but when they move their toy one way, your toy moves the other. Just like in real life, it's like being together even if you're miles apart. We call this new feature bi-directional control and it's truly wonderful. Okay. So uh, we, we won't really discuss how it works. I think everyone understood the, the principle of this uh, two-way uh, two uh, control. So I call it te uh, teleaptics. And again, the point, as in uh, Parrot, is to, is to, uh, yes, uh, the point, is that there's something wrong in this commercial. I mean, you know, obviously when we see that, it's ridiculous. There, there's, something, there's something wrong in, in this commercial. And I want to basically discuss what's wrong uh, in, in, the, uh, in the commercial. So those two devices, basically they would enable to uh, bridge the distance through touch. Usually when we touch, we touch by contact. If I shake your hands, I need you know, to touch, you know, to be in contact with your hands, but there would be a way to touch uh, uh, through the distance. So I call it teleaptics, you know, we touch at a distance. So, uh, of course, there's a difference with Paro. In Paro, technology aims at replacing the, women, the human beings, whereas in the Hug shirt, it is in between the human beings. So. Uh, there would be, uh, I think the hug shirt, in fact, or the, uh, the love toy, as they call it, uh, love ants, in fact, corresponds, uh, really express a whole trend in uh, 
uh, let's say, a kind of continental uh, philosophy of technology. For example, it really uh, illustrates perfectly what Derrida says at the end of Jean-Luc Nancy uh, in, his, in his book, Jean-Luc Nancy Le Touché. In the very end, uh, so Derrida has uh, discussed uh, uh, Le Touch and Jean-Luc Nancy's uh, analysis of touch, and at the very end, Derrida says that uh, touch is not, uh, should not be separated from, from technology, and that Derrida says the seat of technology is between the skins that touch, the space between the skin that touch. And that's exactly where technology is in uh, the Herc shirt of or the love toy. It could also, uh, we could also discuss Bernard Stiegler's views about synchronization and Bernard Stiegler's idea that technology is synchronizing. That's exactly what Lovens uh, tried to do, synchronize the two uh, toys through distance. You could say it's uh, an illustration of Paul Virilio's claustrophobia. Paul Virilio says that uh, technology keeps bringing distance, and instead of having this open horizon that we have, that we used to have, now we're stuck into this this space, which in fact is smaller. And that would be the same. There is, you know, you can't get rid of your friend by sending him or her to to Tokyo. He he or her can still uh, send you hugs. Or um, or there's in fact on the love and uh, love toys. There's in fact a function where there's a, a notification on your uh, smartphone if your friend has used uh, his or her uh, toy. So I think there's a, a, this device would actually illustrate quite a lot of this continental philosophy of technology. But of course, when we see the video, we feel that there's something wrong. That is not, you know, technology is not about that. And if it is related to touch, it's not about this kind of touch. So the origin of teleaptics, in fact, could, be, uh, could start in Descartes at the beginning of, la diop of the, the dioptrics. So Descartes analyzes a vision. And at the very beginning of this text, uh, Descartes imagined a blind man who is using his stick, his stick in order to uh, find his way. And through his stick, he actually uh, touches, you know, he can feel the objects on, on the ground. And Descartes says, you, you could almost say that the blind minds, the blind men, uh, see with their hands, or that the stick is the organ of some sixth sense that was given to them instead of sight. So what I want to so of course, that could be the origin of teleaptics, but uh, a touch without contact. But more importantly to me, what Descartes put in place is the idea of an exchange uh, between senses. The fact that with, with his stick, the blind man see with his hands. And in, uh, when, what justified this use of, of the verb see is that what makes our senses what they are is not so much their content as their property. And a touch that can be uh, that can take place uh, at a distance, then become a, ki a kind of sight. Also, in this text, there's the idea that technology transform our sensibility so as to open up a sixth sense, which has to do with sight as much as we, as we, stu as we touch. And another point which I want to stress and to which I'll come back later is that the stick is uh, transparent to touch. When, when you touch the ground with the stick, what you actually feel is the ground. And you actually feel the texture of the ground or the irregularities of the ground. You, don't, you no longer feel, I mean, you, you don't pay attention to the stick uh, in your hand. So the stick is transparent like a plane of glass is transparent. The glass, it, uh, it brings you the visual that is behind it. In the same way, the stick brings you the tactile that is on the other side of the stick. And it's, you forget the stick itself as you forget you don't see the glass through which you see outside. So the stick becomes transparent in the realm of the tactile. OK. So, So 
So what has happened since Descartes? What makes the difference between uh, Descartes stick and the, uh, the technology of the Herc shirt? The fact is that the stick has been broken. So how it has been broken? It has been broken because we have discovered that the content of perception can be coded, can be coded, it can be represented by something else, and as such, abstracted from its, or, its original support and transported either through space or through time. That's what uh, Edison's gramophone is about, and it's uh, something that is uh, uh, explicit in Wiener's uh, cybernetic, that perception is information, information may be abstracted from its material support, coded, transported, and decoded. So the stick has literally been broken. For instance, we could imagine that the, that the stick is now uh, carried through a kind of robot that like a vacuum cleaner, you know, that moves around the room, and the vibration are sent to a kind of, of stick that I sent, you know, sent through radio to a kind of stick that I hold in my hand, and the, through the stick that I hold in my hand, I would be able to feel the, the textures of the ground all around the room. You, you understand? So what I mean, I really want to stress that, that's for me an important point, it is not only that the stick of Descartes, the stick that Descartes imagined, have been extended. You know, there's the famous part in Diderot's uh, letter on uh, the blinds, when Diderot is interviewing a blind man, and he, an imaginary blind man, and Diderot asks him uh, whether he would like to see, and the blind man said that he would rather uh, want uh, stretchable arms. You know, arms that could be long enough to touch the moon, for instance. So that's not what happened. It's not that we have stretchable arm. It is literally that the stick has been broken. Why is that? Because what this technology uh, succeeds in doing is breaking the uh, reaction in uh, the optics. So in usual life, to touch is being touched. If I uh, shake someone's hand, I touch. Uh, his or her hand, and he or she touches my hand. Being touching is the same thing, or goes with being touched. That's not the the. That's not uh, the case with sight. I can see without being seen. And what these technologies have done is to break the reciprocity of touch. And all these devices. Enables, you, enables the user to be touched without touching or to touch without being touched. And you have, so you have, for instance, uh, uh, a system which is called uh, Tesla Touch, and which is really, uh, so on the uh, screen, the screen has in fact texture. So you can, if you put your uh, finger on the screen, you're supposed to uh, touch, you know, to feel the texture of the material. Uh, so it's really a touch at a distance, and of course, if you touch the sand, you know, you leave no mark on the sand. You touch, but in a way, you are not being touched. Okay, and in the same way, that's what I, I mean. If you look on YouTube uh, about love ants, or they have a, uh, there's an alternative company which is called Love Pats. What is it used for? It's not to uh, bring couple together, with, you know, when one is in New York and the other one is in Paris. It is, in fact, devices which are which are used for um, uh, a sex scam, and it is used without reciprocity. It is someone is being touched without touching, and that's what these devices are about. They are breaking the reci the reciprocity of touch. And what's, that's what is obviously wrong in the commercial, that we can feel that uh, the commercial is, is aberrant. In a way, it's a lie. So that's, in a way, we see that through this technology, there's not so much teleaptics, just touching at a distance. There's a transformation of touch. The fact that touch becomes as sight in the sense that it loses its reciprocity to become a non-reciprocal sense as sight. I can see, 
without being seen. In the same way, I can touch without being touched, or I can be touched without touching. Now what I want to argue is that symmetrically, sight also takes some of the property of touch. So what you see maybe not too well is a, a smartphone when it's a system which, call, which is called telecards, which, uh, would, uh, which enables you to see various uh, uh, rooms in your house in order to you know, uh, check that you're not being a burglar. So what I'm interested in is that you have on the screen, you have a multiplicity of uh, perception. You have like the four rooms of your house that uh, you can see at the same time. And uh, it is the transformation of sight, and it's, uh, especially uh, it shows by comparison with Deleuze and Guattari analysis of optics and haptics in the last chapter of Mille Plateau. The difference, the main difference between optics and haptics for Deleuze is that optics is global, whereas haptics is local. For instance, I see the room, I see the whole room at once. On the other hand, if I want to touch, I have to touch one thing at a time. Or in fact, as I have two hands and, you know, uh, I, and five uh, fingers on each hand, I have a multiplicity of touch, local touch, that I need to resynchronize in order to have a global view of the thing. So uh, sight, usual sight, gives me a global view, but through touch, I have a multiple local views that I need to assemble together. And the, our sight on the internet or with our screen, it becomes haptics in this sense, that we have a multiplicity of local view and we need to resynchronize them. It's like basically when I have the various rooms uh, of my house on my screen, it's like I had uh, multiple hands that touch part of my house and through these local views, I reassemble them in order to know what's happening in my house. Of course, uh, that's the same thing for the surveillance of a city. You don't need to see all that's going on the, in the city. You will have punctual views, and through these punctual, punctual views, these local view, you can find out what's happening in the city. So I will uh, now oppose uh, the panoptics versus the synaptics. Uh, so why would I do that? Because my, the idea is that uh, touch has become, uh, has become akin to sight because it has lost its reciprocity. And on the other hand, sight has become akin to touch by losing its globality in order to be local and multiple and in need of resynchronization. So I'll call this uh, sense that you know, sight and touch uh, are going to, I call it synaptic, and I oppose it to uh, the idea of a panopticon uh, developed by Bentham. So, of course, uh, uh, Bentham was uh, discussed by Foucault uh, in the idea of disciplinary uh, societies, and uh, then discussed by Deleuze, who said that Foucault was wrong to take uh, the panopticon as a model for contemporary society, and that our contemporary societies were, uh, were rather controlled society, where instead of having a guard that see uh, all, you have it's everyone who is surveilling everyone else. And my point would be that in the panopticon, so the panopticon is a prison, and you have a central tower, and in the central towers there's a guard, and the guard can see all that's happening in the different cells that are around him. And uh, with contemporary technology, we don't need this global view that sees all, that see all. What we need is a plurality, what we have and need is a plurality of local view, which we resynchronize by isolating relevant parameters. I don't need to see everything, I just need to see, to have punctual views, which I then resynchronize by uh, detecting relevant parameters.
So how long have I been speaking? About half an hour? Yes. Okay. Okay, so for this surveillance, this, the absence of reciprocity is uh, a central uh, concern. And in fact, the, uh, in Bentham Panopticon, the central, the guard is, the guard can see the various prisoners, but he's himself invisible to, to them because he's hidden in, in, his, in, his, uh, in his tower. So I would say that the same, go, the same goes for, uh, uh, the synoptic sense, and that if uh, and that uh, the same go for the uh, synoptic uh, for the synopticon. That, for instance, the uh, man who guards uh, the parking, the man who guards the parking, he has this screen with all those uh, local images of the parking. He doesn't see the whole parking, but through these local images, he can make sure that nothing particular happens in the parking. And of course, he is uh, 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 himself invisible. He is invisible, um, uh, he is invisible, but my point would be that, in fact, he is not, uh, uh, he is invisible to the you know, the, the bad guy who tried to, to steal a car uh, in the parking, but he's not invisible to the machine himself that enables him to see uh, into the parking. For example, the machine would know if he stops clicking on the various images, or the machine would know if he clicks on a particular images. So I would... Uh, 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 precisely uh, argue that the machine is transparent as uh, the uh, stick in uh, Descartes' example, but it, it could be considered as itself the uh, unperceived perceiver, because the machine precisely, if uh, the man clicks on a certain window, it is like the machine, he doesn't touch the machine, the machine is transparent. What he sees or perceives is a certain place in the parking. But the machine perceives his movement. So the machine would be the unperceived uh, perceiver. And of course the question is that uh, Bentham uh, defended the idea that the uh, guard in the panopticon would be invisible. Uh, but there should be tourists in the panopticon so as to make sure that the guard uh, was not doing anything wrong. So would there be tourists in the uh, synapticon? Okay, so my, my point was to uh, show that we have a touch that becomes sight in, in that it becomes distant and it loses its the reciprocity that it, that it has in life. And we have a sight that becomes touch in the sense that it is local, multiple, and it needs to be synchronized. So both seems to merge into a sight, a, a, a new sense that would have both visual and tactile contact and that would have a particular properties. It would be distance, local, without reciprocity, and in need of synchronization. And this sense, it is this new sense, which I call synaptic, is neither like sight nor like touch. It has not the properties of touch, it has not the property of uh, sight. Okay, so now I want to have another video interviewed. So it's about uh, now.
So this is uh, now is now. Uh, so this is not exactly now. It's another robot called Paper, which is uh, com which has been designed by the same uh, company. The difference is that it has a, uh, a screen and it doesn't walk. It, it, it has wheels and it has facial recognition, so as to be able to read uh, your emotions. So again, this is a point I want to, to uh, stress. The fact that even in now, uh, technology that is related to emotion, uh, that is uh, an aspect of touch that uh, is there. In the, the, just the footage that we just saw, that's an advertisement by the, the designer. It's, uh, it, first it was the French company Aldebaran, and now it's a Japanese company called SoftBank. But, so it's an advertisement, and they put stress on the, the, the touch, the way that the girl is touching Nao's hand. But in the first footage is some, uh, someone who just filmed uh, herself on, on YouTube, and there are loads of them, uh, and you can see that the way the girl is holding Nao like a baby, and she's touching you know, the plastic of, of Nao. So it's something, in a way, there's no reason why we would want to touch now and why there is so many footage with touching now. You have also uh, another uh, something that was reported uh, uh, by the Irish Mirror uh, recently and has been over-reported since, is that uh, so two uh, uh, Japanese college uh, boys uh, put on the screen of Nao uh, some uh, 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 woman breasts, and they program Nao so that when they touch the breast that appeared, Nao would make some movement. And from there, the company made uh, users, because Nao is rented, uh, made users sign a contract that they would not turn their Nao into a sex device or make him do anything that is sexual. And it's the video that of the two Japanese college boys is very gross, and again, the question of gender certainly comes up there, but it is still strange the way, it's still remarkable the way that the company wants to uh, completely exclude, exclude now from any sexual connotation, and that by making user uh, sign a contract. And the thing they are, uh, rehearsing, uh, always rehearsing, is that now is a robot that is sweet, or in French, because it was first manufactured in France, that it is bienveillant, that it is benevolent, and then something they want to, to stress. So uh, another, I mean, so the first aspect of now is that it is a toy, you know, and we saw uh, now playing, but also now uh, watches over us, and those two uh, footage, I don't know if it's working, no it's not. Uh, the two next footage are uh, again from a commercial from the, from the company. So in this one he now uh, uh, watches over an, again an old lady. And then he will, uh, he will be, a, uh, it will be a babysitter. So that's why now makes a good uh, watcher because he can be programmed to detect uh, a brusque fall. Thank you, doctor. 
I called for doctor. He will be here soon. And and so the last. Uh, the last uh, feature of it's not now it's not exactly now it's uh, the new version paper is that paper is supposed to read your facial emotion and adapt to uh, his behavior to your facial emotions so if he sees he, you are unhappy he will try to make you happy And again, she embraces uh, now. Okay, um, uh, so uh, uh, so now it seems to be uh, is uh, to me the uh, kind of device that uh, uh, shares everything I've been uh, spoken uh, I've, I've spoken about since now. Um, the fact now we take in we take it for an individual being, but he's not, and he only. Uh, communicate, I mean, he, his brain, so to speak, is not in his plastic envelope. To have the facial recognition, recognition he in fact communicates through a, to a, a central uh, server. And he is also, uh, uh, he's also uh, susceptible of being trained by the various different nows. So, for example, if a now learned some trick somewhere, uh, then it can send like you uh, program your now in order to be able to play chess, let's say, then this would, uh, the, the chess app could be communicated to all the, uh, the possible now. So in this, w in, in this way, uh, one can say that now's perception is synaptic. What now sees is in fact what all the now, see, the now see. That is a multiplicity of local view. The now, they don't see all that happens in the city, but they have a multiplicity of uh, local view through which uh, they learn. Also, uh, they, it is a sense without reciprocity, is that you see your individual now that you have at home, but you don't see the true now, which is the central server through which all now uh, communicate. But what I would be, what I'm interesting in now is that could it do, could now do even more and in fact tell me what to think or what to feel? That is, how do we know that now is in fact reading my emotions on my face or that he's in fact telling me if I am happy or unhappy? And that's the idea that I want to play with in the last five minutes. So you know how it happens when someone tells me Oh, uh, you look very, you don't look too well today. I immediately feel unwell. Could it work like that with now? So I call it the syndrome of the thermometer because of my ankle. So I'll skip the film by Jacques Tati, my ankle, and I speak of my own ankle. So my own ankle has a fascination with thermometers. Uh, I have an uncle, and uh, he, when he visited uh, when I was a child, he would always have thermometers, you know, the usual kind, and he would put them everywhere in the room. And I wondered why, and I realized that in fact he 
it was like he did not know whether he was hot or whether he was cold. And he checked the thermometer, and if, say, the temperature was above 20, he would say, oh, I'm hot, and he would take off his jacket. If the temperature was lower, he would, uh, he would you know, put, need a, uh, he would need another sweater. So that's not that he had some kind of, you know, particular disease or psychological symptoms. No, that was just a way to behave. He, he, do not, he stopped uh, trying to read his first person experiment, experience. He gave this to the thermometer. That was the thermometer would tell him whether it was, whether he was hot or whether he was cold. So that's what I call the syndrome of the thermometer. The syndrome of the thermometer is relying on a machine for reading what used to be a subjective experience or an experience in the first person. So uh, there would be, yeah, uh, uh, okay, I'll skip with the uh, Wittgenstein, uh, I'll skip the Wittgenstein form of life. Uh, there would be example from neuroscience or and data analysis. Uh, an experience I like is uh, from an experience that is an installation of Jean-Philippe Toussaint at the Louvre. Uh, and it was a machine for reading salts. And that was a machine that was supposed to catch the images that pass in your head when uh, you are reading a novel. So, and the images would be uh, on the screen. And the idea of the installation well, was a fake. I mean, the machine did not work. But the idea was that you would see on the screen the images that come up to your mind when you read the novel. But that's an aberration because the, imagine, the images that you have in your mind when you're reading a novel, you have them in your mind. You're supposed to, to see them. So the idea that you would learn what's going in your mind when you read a novel by looking at the screen is exactly the syndrome of the thermometer. It is giving the machine the task to read what should be your first person exper experiment, experience. Another uh, thing, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, perspective is uh, this mail I received uh, last year. We also had the presidential election, and there was Macron against Marine Le Pen, and I received this email, uh, second round, who is your candidate? And in fact, that's a company that's, that claims that, uh, she, that it is able to tell you for whom you want to vote. So it's not that, you know, it would be very classical, you know, you ask me my income, you ask me my level of, you know, of education, and you tell me with a good, uh, with, you know, a small statistical error for whom I am going to vote. But it's a different thing to uh, aim at telling me for whom I want to vote. And that's, again, giving to, the mach to this machine, to this algorithm, the task to tell me what should be my first person experiment. I should know for whom I want to vote. Maybe I don't know for whom I'm going to vote, but in our form of life, I'm supposed to know for whom I want to vote. Uh, okay, so <coughs> um, <coughs> there is an installa another installation, by, and I'll conclude on that. There is another installation by Maurice, uh, the French artist Maurice Benayoun, who's called, which is called Emotion Forecast, and uh, he, um, uh, he uh, it's a pastiche of uh, trans, uh, the meteorological trends or uh, trends in the financial world, uh, but it gives trends in emotion. So there would be on the, um, there would be different cities and the way our emo uh, emotions uh, uh, change. So it's only uh, a film that he, he has made. But could we imagine that uh, it could actually happen? Could we imagine that we had uh, that we had a mood app on our phones and that the mood app would like scan our mails, check how many times I've uh, looked at the meteorological forecast. Uh, it would 
have figured out if I, uh, well, he would just, you know, scan my mails and see what I've done on the phone, and he would tell me how, you know, in what mood I am today. And could we use that as my uncle used uh, his thermometer? That is, instead of wondering myself whether I am happy or unhappy, whether I am happy or unhappy, I would just wait for the app to tell me whether I am happy or unhappy. And the question is, wouldn't we have a sufficient faith in the machine so as to believe what the phones tell us and in fact be happy when the phone tells us we're happy or uh, be unhappy when the, when the phone tells us we are not. Okay, so the conclusion, uh, okay, well, I'll just finish here. Uh, so the, the idea was that I've tried, you know, the first part on the synaptic, the idea that sense and touch merge into another uh, sensibility. And in the second smaller part, the question whether we would not have enough faith in the machine to behave as my uncle behaved with his thermometer, that is, to give to the machine the task of reading what used to be our first person experiment. Okay, thank you for your attention. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I, I'm curious, as always, about sexuality and, <laughs> and uh, how this relates to technology. And um, so, so I would like to ask you what, what your thoughts are about this, uh, you know, contract and thing and that tries to separate technology and sexuality. Is it um, maybe a kind of projection of sexuality to certain parts like breasts or, or penises or whatever that are forbidden and then uh, this is a concept of sexuality there because you could argue that sexuality for example with Deleuze and Guattari uh, is everywhere so it's, it's like a grass so everywhere we're seeing or touching there's already sexuality implied so if we uh, embrace technology somehow there's always sexuality also in our relation to technology implied. Th that would be my take on it, but I would like to hear what, what you think about this thing. Uh, so you mean the, the contract that the users have now have to sign? Okay. Um, there, there are two kinds of contracts. One is the contract that the user signs with
some kind of sexuality in this novel. Are you not communicating some kind of you know, sexuality in uh, And I think maybe the, the problem would be uh, in a way earlier, and as uh, Sandra uh, discussed this morning, whether there's not something wrong in giving to know the form of a child, you know, more or less. Tina. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have two questions. The first question is about your notion of media. You, ex you explained with um, a Descartes and the stick. Uh, and the idea was that the blind human being is touching the ground and not uh, and is forgetting the stick, but what about if he is um, imagining uh, the ground via the stick? So this could be another notion of mediality, very linked to auto stimulation, um, uh, auto simulation, even to s that I simulate uh, the medium. And the second question is about your notion of reciprocity, and um, I'm studying a bit on the robot Sophia which is now very hyped in the internet and in my Facebook filter bubble. And um, so the, Sophia uh, is very, has a lot of mimics and a lot of movement and even <coughs> noise of moving. Um, and uh, this is a robot based on machine learning and that there must, my question is must there must be there more reciprocity because Sophia needs me in order to learn. So to be in like kind of interaction uh, and that I'm more adopting to understand the robot than that the robot is trying to understand me or even perhaps a reciprocal process coming up with uh, like a new step or another re resist or re register if we go with machine learning.
no longer to take to be uh, uh, passively part of this of this contact. And so this reciprocity was really discussed. I think that's a very uh, important transformation of of, uh, of Dutch. I must say that I Uh, no, the well, other people. There was another question for the I've got one. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I got a couple of questions, but I think I keep it to two, 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 two questions. Uh, I would like to come back to the thing that you've mentioned um, with the space in between, or the space in between the two hands, the agents of touch, which is like technology, as you've described it with Derrida and his reading of non C. And I. Uh, and after your last comment, I wondered why you kind of isolated the talk about senses so much from the body. I had the impression that it was you, we were quite focused on, the, on, on, on this kind of on, on the senses and how synaptics is, is developed. Um, but on the other hand, um, I, w I wonder myself uh, what kind of relation would that have for you with. Um, to the to, to the body as a whole, because I'm saying that because the the example that you've mentioned of the card is also a classical example in uh, Merleau-Ponty with this with the blind man, man stick, and right now for ex um, for example is there's in uh, Karen Barat's reading of this uh, um, of this Merleau-Ponty example with the blind man and the stick, she makes exactly the point that through changing haptics into seeing as you've described it, there's also we also constitute a new body, so. The, the form, the thing, to, the, the the point would be to say, okay, that we are we are not only talking about transformations of senses and the development of new sensuality, but also of new constitutions of the body. So, the the idea of the body, as well as the the idea of the senses, is kind of a non-fixed um, um, entity that's in in a kind of uh, uh, ongoing 
um, 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 relation with the, with, with the environment. And that's why I, I boil it down to, to the question um, of, or just uh, to the comment that maybe in the, in the way as you've described it, another term uh, could be um, interesting here, uh, which is the term of transduction. Transduction as the kind of transfor uh, transformation of signals, mechanical signals into digital signals and bodily signals into uh, digital signals, which, which is very helpful to describe this kind of intersections uh, uh, that, that, you've, that you've described, or what happens in this in-between. Yeah, Marcus, please. Uh, pardon me? What? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I always come back to this little fluffy white thing uh, that you showed us in the, in the first slides, and I was wondering, uh, what, what is the uncanny about this? What, uh, uh, what is so disturbing about these things? Isn't it, could, couldn't it be that these things um, make us perceive that they are sufficient for us to fulfill our needs? Isn't it that they remind us that we might uh, feel or connect with other people the same way that we connect with a machine? Isn't the, the real uncanniness that there's no real uh, difference between how we feel for other people and how we feel for things. And not that the, that, that the thing or the robot is inducing uh, some emotions into us, but that, that what makes them alive is our projection onto them. Images 
thank you very much. I think this is the time for a coffee and for a applause to... Yeah, thank you very much.